This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Compare loving yourself to the love your parents shared with you. Your parents may not have liked you all the time, but they always loved you for who you are. In other words, you may not like some of the habits you have or the patterns you fall into. Yet, at the end of the day, if you can look yourself in the mirror and say, I love you, you are rocking the self-love. Valerie Atelis interviews Jennifer Espinoza Goswami, a public speaker and certified holistic health coach at Weightless LLC. Jen Espinoza Goswami is a public speaker and certified holistic coach at Weightless LLC. A longtime member of the 100 Pound Club, she is also a marathon runner who has been featured on Women's Health, Reader's Digest, Prevention, Spry Living, and many national media. When not presenting wellness seminars in her hometown of Minneapolis or online, you can find her facilitating confidence in her clients on her website. She is mom to two beautiful daughters, lives in Minnesota, and will do anything for a tasty taco. Meet Jen at weightlesschronicles.com. Here's the interview with Jennifer Espinoza Goswami. In your own words, who is Jen Espinoza Goswami? When I was growing up, I was referred to by three different monikers. One of them was friend, one of them was spin, and one of them was love. So Jen is a combination of all three. I am referred to as love by my partner and husband of 18 years, Pratip Goswami. I'm referred to as friend by my siblings. I have two twin sisters and a brother. And Spin is from my last name, Espinosa. And I like to think that that serves two purposes there. It's not just a part of my last name and my heritage and the family I came from. It's also how I see the world. I take in the world with my unique perspective, but I also like to turn it and spin it in my own unique flavor, both in my personal and professional side. So that's kind of how I would summarize who Jen is. And speaking of authenticity, how would you describe that, Jen? What is like to be authentic? It's something that we do all the time and we have to be authentic all the time in the sense of following that description or it's more flexible, we can dance even in between that. I've always been a little puzzled by this idea of being authentic. And here's why. I have never felt like I was not being true to who I was. That's not to say that I'm perfect or I always do things the right way or that people don't have feedback or criticism for me. Instead, it's more of a matter of I just am who I am and you can either accept me as I am or not, but I'm not bothered either way, whether you accept me or you don't accept me. So when people throw around this idea of authenticity, I get a little bit confused by that because I think that we are all as human beings acting and doing the best we can in this life. And no one has the ability or the power to tell us whether we're being authentic to our inner selves or not. That is something that we can determine for ourselves. Um, If it aligns with you, you hear that phrase and it gets you angry, then chances are good you may be struggling with authenticity. But for me, it always kind of irritated me because I'm like, I'm always who I am. And uh, good or bad, you know, (laughs) take me as I am. That's how I show up. And that's what I help other people do is show up as they are with no permission or no um, critique or self Uh, limiting beliefs, but the true sense that 
who they are is important and matters in this world. And there will be fans, raving fans of their work and what they do. And there will be critiques and trolls as well. So, you know, take it and leave it. Take what you need and leave what you don't. That's a very interesting perspective. I agree that we are just being ourselves anyway. So the way exactly the way we are now behaving now and thinking. I guess the, what comes to mind when I'm um, by listening to you is the idea of self-acceptance and unconditional self-love. Do you believe in such um, such a practice or idea? Self-love is an interesting one for me. So um, having been morbidly obese in my life, I can say that I believe anything is possible for me and has always been. I just didn't have an interest in being a thinner person in this world. Eventually I did lose a hundred pounds, so I did have an interest. But it's really interesting because I never lost the weight because I thought I wasn't complete, whole, or lovable as a morbidly obese person. Instead, I did it for other reasons. So um, there's a movie, and I can't remember the quote. I think it's from um, Enchanted, which is a Disney live action movie. And it turns from cartoon to live action in the middle of the movie. But there's a prince who's going after his princess. And at one point, his uh, evil henchman says, do you love yourself, sir? And he said, what's not to love? I take on that perspective. What's not to love about me? And that doesn't mean that I always love myself. I don't think it's possible for any of us as individuals to love ourselves 100% all of the time. That's a great goal to have, but it's not possible. <laughs> so, But there's, there's nothing not to love in who we are is how I see it. Even by saying that, it sounds like it's unconditional. It really it relates to that idea when you say that. That's what I hear, unconditional love. There's nothing about me that's not lovable. So that sounds very much like unconditional love, Jen, by listening to you. Maybe you don't call it that, but it really comes across as that, which is the most wonderful thing to be in this world in that state of being, of mine, of it's okay to be just as I am. What is your idea? How would you describe this idea we have about being healthy? That's a question that I asked many years ago to myself. What is to be a healthy person coming from the, the perspective of the body, mind, and perhaps spirit? Well, that shifts over the years and the decades, doesn't it? And sometimes there's cycles for that as well. <laughs> there are two different ways to look at that. There's the, um, the perspective that's given to us. And by that, I mean what we see in the media, in magazines, by other health gurus and things of that nature. They tell us what we think, what we should see healthy to be. I am a rebel in, in a way because I do not look the picture of health. I feel great in who I am and where I am right now. So I'm more of the perspective that health is a pursuit, just like the pursuit of happiness. There's no end point to health. As long as we're living and doing the best we can today, that can be healthy. And so sometimes the best for us today is to eat bad food. Bad. I don't use the words bad and good for food. I hate that. Like there's nothing guilty or shameful about food. But sometimes we eat the foods that we know are not improving our health. And sometimes that's what we need from an emotional, spiritual standpoint for that day. And it's okay. But it's our feelings and emotions around it that we have to examine. So unhealthy could be that we are constantly in conflict with ourselves and what we feel to be right yeah. or don't know what's right for us. What is your idea of balance? Do you believe in, in coming to a point of having this not perfect balance, but just balance. It, it sounds like it's a perfect thing in itself, right? Being balanced. What is your idea about that? Well, the funny thing about that, Valeria, is um, do, do anyone, like if you have a room full of men in a workplace, a corporate setting, for example, do you ever hear someone asking, what does balance mean in a room full of men? I don't <laughs> think that conversation is even happening. Right. So I find yes. it very <laughs> I, I find it very curious that with two women having a conversation on this podcast that um, that comes up. And I've heard it with my mom friends. I've heard it with my clients that I coach. I've heard it in my business friend circle. I'm curious that this 
tends to come up quite frequently within women groups. And because I'm curious about that, I feel that there's something can be done to change that narrative. Not sure what that looks like, but I would like to be part of that discussion of how we can change this idea of balance. It's not a conversation that's happening in other circles. And so it makes me wonder, is there some way we can flip or spin that perspective to say it's not about being balanced, um, but it's about perhaps being authentic or aligned with what feels right today or in the moment or what feels most happy for you? Because I feel that a lot of women um, like to put happiness or emotions on the back burner. Either they hold them within themselves because it's shameful or they don't want to... I experienced this. I didn't like to cry in front of people, especially when I was uh, being teased and bullied for being very heavy. Um, I've been teased and bullied by strangers. I've been teased and bullied by my own family members. And, um, and sometimes I felt like the, you know, I had to put happiness or what my needs were on the back burner. And I think that's where the challenge is. It's not necessarily about balance. It's not about having all of the things But it's about recognizing the things that are most important to us as individuals. Yes. As we're experiencing them. And what do you think the purpose of life is? The purpose of being a human body? Have you ever wondered? Wow. This is quite a powerful question. Wow. Um, The purpose of life. Well, if you know the answer to that, I'm all ears. (laughs) I I have no illumination on this particular question. I am still finding my purpose and I still enjoy the journey of finding purpose. Mm. I have yet to discover what that is. However, I will put this out there for the listeners who are in the same boat as I am. I think I think that sometimes there's this opportunity for others to say, I have a purpose. Where's your purpose? And it's not about being better than someone else. It's not about competing with what other people are doing. So I would put that out there as a uh, caveat, if you will. If you don't currently have a big overarching purpose for yourself in your life, it's okay. When we need the information and when it's available to us, it will show up for us. And that's also part of the journey. So I don't know what the purpose of life is. I hope someday I will get closer to understanding that. So let me ask you a more specific question, the, uh, the, still the warm-up questions. Happiness. What is happiness to you? And what are some of the misconceptions about happiness? I'm a big fan of journaling practices and journaling prompts and using those as a reflection and a mirror for what shows up in our lives. And... To me, happiness is, it's momentary. It's flashes, it's smells, it sounds. I'm very heavily um, in my body. I'm a very physical person. So how I experience happiness tends to be a touch, a smile, a smell, um, a sound, you know, and everyone has their own gateway to feeling happiness or experiencing happiness. For me, it's most likely through things I smell things I see or things I hear because I sometimes receive intuitive hits where I hear information that maybe is not being explicitly stated. And that's one of my strengths as a coach as well. But that's how I tend to receive happiness because it's me noticing. It's me being aware and it's me typically connecting with someone else's experience. And I'm a big believer in community and connection That's why I'm on social media, because I don't think it's a negative thing to be on social media. Yes, there are negative aspects of it. But I do believe that when we come together as human beings in a community and support each other in our great work, whatever that is, that's when we progress as human beings and as the earth on the earth here. I love your wisdom, Jen. Thank you. Thank you for being you and for being here. It feels so true to me when you talk about the body and being here embodied and uh, sensing with the senses, not just the five senses, you added intuition, which is another important one. So that's also highly spiritual. (laughs) That's funny how... Can I share a small little story with (laughs) you? Yes, yes, (laughs) yeah. So back back in my college days, they make you take an inventory personality assessment. Yeah. And that assessment will identify the best career situation for you. 
And my top results from that career inventory was being a pastor or in a religious institution as a leader. So I find that funny that you point out the spiritual piece of myself because I don't see it. You just being um, living that spirituality without labeling. Yeah, you're not trying to box to to you know I am a Catholic or whatever it is. You just being, which is this is to me is freedom. That's where I call it freedom. I love it. So thank you for being you because yeah, it's amazing how you just come across and resonate. The body, my body feels it too. I have goosebumps and all. So it's interesting. So talk to me for a moment how you became a holistic and health coach. How do you work with your clients? How do you offer your services online, offline? Yeah, I I became a coach quite by accident, which maybe is the experience you've heard before. Um, I actually started my business, which is called Waitlist, as a professional speaking company. So my intent was to share uh, health tips with organizations and associations nationwide. Um, You know, seminars, workshops, lunch and learns, um, paid opportunities where people would bring me in to speak to their their employees, their team members, and share some wisdom around how I was able to lose 100 pounds, um, how to make it a simple process, not specifically that you have to follow a certain diet du jour or anything like that. I don't follow a specific diet, but I do feel that many of us benefit from a process. And I think that is lost in the details of different diet programs out there. So that's how I started my business. But eventually I got to a point where my audiences were walking up to me and telling me that they wanted to take action on what I was sharing at the front of the room. And so, you know, this this seed came up for me of, can I serve people even more than I'm doing right now? Because it's one thing to stand up as a speaker and share 60 minutes of wisdom and then leave. It's quite another to establish a long-term coaching relationship with someone and facilitate their own personal journey. Luckily, I enjoy doing both. And the other side of speaking is being a good listener. So those are superpowers I have. They're yin and yang in my life. And (laughs) that's what I can provide to coaching clients. Um, So I didn't pursue the typical health coaching path, which might be selling a supplement or getting certified through IIN or some other popular programs out there. Instead, what was important to me as a service provider was following certain standards and ethics and guidelines that are uh, approved by a governing body of such. So health coaching is an unregulated industry for the most part. And I wanted to be part of a more regulated industry. So I decided to get certified through a an ICF approved body. It's called Holistic Coach Training Institute. And um, the ICF is International Coaching Federation. So it's composed of coaching from every walk of life, whether it's business, executive, life, personal, health, any kind of coaching you can think of. But what I've noticed is coaching is not like a program. Coaching is a process. And I don't want to help people get into yet another program that may or may not be effective for them. I want to help them figure out the process of navigating their lives in such a way that they can rinse and repeat as many times as they need to in as many areas of their life will support their whole well-being. And that's why I decided to go with that type of coaching. And I typically work one-on-one with people. I have done group programs. I actually love group programs because I'm a community-based person. I yeah. love to be a part of the community. Yeah. But I see the greatest transformation in my clients when they work one-on-one with me. Do you talk to your clients or you ever write about intuitive eating or have you practiced that yourself, if it is a practice? Yes. Well, I'm a big fan of Michelle May's work and she talks about um, mindful eating. So similar to intuitive eating approach, she actually trains other people coaches on how to use this process. She's a big fan of, like, I'm a big fan of hers. I met her in person here at a conference in Minneapolis. I don't personally follow intuitive eating. And here's why. I have a lifelong issue with eating. I'm an emotional eater. 
And I cannot always recognize the signs of eating for reasons other than hunger when I'm eating. So we can try to be more present and mindful in the moment, but it won't always happen. And because I have been able to eat myself into being 100 pounds over my ideal weight, it's a slippery slope for me. And I won't go down that path because I don't resonate with it. However, I do tend to work with clients who it will resonate with because they don't want to do another diet. They don't want to count calories. And I don't teach people how to count calories. I follow more of a macronutrient-based approach because it's simple, it's easy, it's friendly to any dietary preference. And that's how I want my clients to navigate life is to not be stuck into a strict program and rigid structure, but for them to be able to flow and be with what they need um, at the time they need it. So it's, it's very mindful in how I coach my clients, but I don't necessarily say, yes, we're doing a mindful eating program. Instead, it's rather implied and they can take what they need from the concepts and the guidance. That makes sense to me. This idea of flowing, <laughs> the flowing component, just taking from life what we need in at this moment, just being present enough to do that and accept if we go over, if we don't do it at all, it's okay too. I love yes. that idea because I see that a lot of the issues I have had, it was because of restrictions. I was trying to control myself in so many ways that I created mm. so many problems. I mean, I had lots of emotional problems and then health problems because of that, that trying to control the body, the mind. So yes. control, it never works. And um, what is another word, Jen, if you're going to replace that word control, what would that be? What would you say instead of control? I would say confident. Mm -hmm. Confident eating, because, you know, we have a lot of associations with food. Some of them are positive. Some of them are negative. At the end of the day, though, you can always choose what you put in your mouth. I mean, given whatever restrictions you currently have, budgetary restrictions or financial or any, anything of that matter, nobody is force feeding you to eat certain things. You certainly can choose at the end of the day what you put in your mouth. And, um, I think it's being confident about the choices you're making yeah. and not letting other people dictate what those choices could or should be for you. That's a good word, confidence. Yeah, it goes back to the idea of kind of um, flowing in a sense of acceptance and unconditional love or unconditional acceptance for what is, what's happening. So that, that makes sense to me, being confident enough to embrace that moment, do what we have to do and not shame ourselves for it. It seems like the main issue is fear. We're just so afraid of everything, not doing, doing too much, and et cetera. Fear. And I'm not sure if we can get to the point of living without fear. Do you mm. think it's possible becoming fearless, as some people say? I think it's possible for some people, but I think it's also dangerous for some people to be fearless. Um, fear is there for a reason. And maybe we don't know what that reason is, but it can be a good guidepost yeah. to keep us within our lane, whatever that lane is. I'm not saying that you have to do everything that's being prescribed to you, but staying in our lane is a helpful thing because it provides clarity and focus. And if you think that you can just go all over the road of wherever you're walking, uh, you will lose that focus and clarity and it will be harder and a longer path for you. So I do think that fear can provide us that uh, boundary and boundaries are good. What an interesting, fascinating dance, isn't it, Jen, this life? Oh, yeah, the <laughs> dance experience. of life, but it's worth, it's worth listening to that music and moving into your own rhythm. Right, beautifully said. So talk to me for a moment. It seems like it doesn't have anything to do with what we are talking, but it does. Um, why you believe self-help books don't really help us? <laughs> You're calling me out on this one. So right. I actually wrote an article about this. And um, I'm a big fan of reading. I digest books almost faster than I digest my last meal. And um, I've been, I'm a voracious reader, a lifelong reader. I'm also a big fan of education, which is why I have a master's degree. Um, I just believe in learning and education. And sometimes the best education we can get is from books. 
However, there's a limit to that because there's knowledge, which education provides access to, whether it's in the form of a book or a certificate or a school, and there's taking action. And I think um, the temptation there, if you're a person who reads a lot of self-help books, just like myself, the temptation is to just keep reading, keep digesting, but not letting those nutrients settle not letting that be activated into energy and something that you can move forward with. We don't pause and give it enough time. So not that reading self-help books is not worth it. Instead, it's having certain intentions about what you need to receive from that particular book you have in your hand. And how do we do that in in the case of um, picking up a book? How do we choose is the book actually choosing us <laughs> in a way it's calling us to read it <laughs> yeah how do we learn to listen from that place of need inner need per se what is being called what we are here to do in this moment and then we just open up and, and let life just be itself and choose what we're supposed to be doing how do we make that happen or how do we allow this happen that's a fascinating perspective about does the book choose us Potentially, because it shows if we choose the book, it means that something about that book speaks to what we need to know in this period of our life. So there is some element of truth there in terms of having the right intention when you pick up the book. So um, this is kind of like the difference between shopping around at your local mall, you know, window shopping, if you will, versus going to the store and saying, I need to buy this article of clothing, and I need it to be a certain color, a certain size. So that's the difference there. You can window shop and pick up whatever catches your attention or stands out to you, and that's window shopping. But if you're like, I need a book that tells me how to improve uh, my confidence levels, you might browse a couple of places, you might ask your friends group if they have recommendations that's still window shopping. But if you're like, I need to know a book on how to be confident with my money, or I need a book on how to be confident about speaking up in front of others when I have anxiety, you have skipped the point of window shopping. And now you have a very specific intention. You're like, I have a goal. I have a result I'm looking to get. And by the way, we're not just talking about books. We're also talking about if you're, um, you know, having a discovery call with a coach, if you're talking to someone about being a mentor The more clear you are when you start that process, the more likely you're going to get the result you're looking for. That absolutely makes sense to me. So knowing what we want and achieving that clarity first. Do you also teach some of your clients to become more clear in that sense when they come with doubts and confusion and not sure about anything? Most of us, we just want to be happy. I say more peace, inner peace than happiness, but yeah. Yeah, the, that's always where it begins. So, so that's when you know someone's in the, the window shopping phase, when they're like, yeah. I just want to be happy. Right. I just want to be healthy. I just want to have a good relationship. That's fine. And it's the responsibility of the coach at that point to coach the person through getting deeper than that. There's two or three levels below what's showing up for that person. So that's part of <laughs> the responsibility and the honor of being a coach is guiding someone through really getting more clear on what that could mean for them. And, um, and I do work with people in terms of getting clear on what their goals are, um, because health means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So it's my responsibility to kind of, um, find the pearl within the oyster of what it is that would shine a light for them so that they will change what they're currently doing to improve their health. Because we could say, oh yeah, I want to do this. I want to, I want to run a marathon. Great. What are you willing to not sacrifice, but what are you willing to change in your current lifestyle in order to make that a reality for you? So that's where it gets nitty gritty. That's a process I like walking people through because it's a fun process. It's a discovery. It's okay. You know, there, there are sacrifices in life going back to your question around balance. Uh, it's not about being balanced necessarily, but if you know you're going to be training for a marathon, you probably need a couple long runs during your week and that's going to take time. So that's a sacrifice you're making. Um, not that, you know, it's an unpleasant thing at all. It can be very pleasant to train for something that you're very passionate about, but understanding how it affects other areas of your life is important. 
I love how you you say that about the fun because it is fun the self discovery self exploration or exploration of anything it's fun it's not yeah. supposed to be tense and and that's why yeah coaches are just incredibly helpful because they do make it fun <laughs> I make it really fun too I have my clients laughing <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, why not? This is part of what this is, right? We are having fun doing what we are supposed to do, eating whatever, just having fun, enjoying uh, rather than doing other things like, I don't know, judging. We get caught up a lot in judgment, but judging ourselves, it's a big one. One of the biggest uh, obstacles from my perspective. And that um, brings me back to the topic of self-love or unconditional self-love. Do you also have a process a program that your clients go through in order to learn to love themselves or this is up to them yeah i actually have a free e-course it's called five days to body bliss yeah because most people when they think of their body they don't attach the word bliss to it and i think we can do better And I think we owe it to our bodies, our beautiful bodies that are the only vehicle we have in this life. I think we owe it to our bodies to share more appreciation, more love, more awareness, and more understanding of our unique vessels in this life. Um, This is the only life we have unless you believe in reincarnation and things of that nature. That's fine. Um, but this is, this is the life we have. This is the body we have. This is the way we can express ourselves in this life. And so my mission is to encourage others and facilitate the process for them to start thinking about their body as a blissful place to be. And so this five day email course basically has short videos that introduces a different way of looking at food, fitness, and your mindset around your body and how you live and breathe and enjoy that body. We're almost at the end. I do have a few more questions for you. You have a blog post that caught my attention because it's kind of funny. You say uh, the sweet reasons you should eat more chocolate. Boy, I love chocolate. So I was like, wow, (laughs) sounds great to me. (laughs) That actually reminds me of the first month after I started my weight loss journey. So I lost 100 pounds in a year. But that first month was kind of the test, the trial run of it, because I had never tried to lose weight before. And that first month, I determined that I was not going to eat a single dessert for 30 days. Now, that may not seem like a big deal. (laughs) But for me, I had gotten to the point in my habits where I was eating dessert after every single meal, including breakfast. Wow. (laughs) So, you know... (laughs) Clearly, moderation was not a thing for me, and I didn't see a reason to have moderation. So that first month for me was very telling Yeah. because when that 30 days was up, you best believe I ordered the most delectable, delicious dessert on earth, and I savored every single bite of that dessert. It was called the offering to the goddess. Wow. <laughs> it was that it was sounds like a chocolate good. fondue with right. like bananas and fruit <laughs> oh. and graham crackers. It was delicious. Wow. <laughs> and it wasn't, I had to experience that lack yeah. of having dessert before I could really savor this chocolate dessert, the offering to the goddess. So it wasn't just an offering, you know, to the goddess above or below or wherever you believe God is existing. It was also an offering to myself. It was a promise that life is not necessarily about what I can't have. Life is a promise of you can still enjoy what you're doing, what you're eating. It's not about have to eat the salad to get the reward of the dessert. It's not about have to burn off the calories so that I can have a drink. That's not how I want my life to be. It's not a transaction. Instead, it's about there are certain foods you like, And there's nothing wrong with liking what you like. And sometimes that includes chocolate. And there are health benefits to certain types of chocolate, which you'll see in the article if you take a look at it. Uh, Dark chocolate is very beneficial to our health, actually. And there are some cultures that live to 90s, 100s, and they frequently eat chocolate. So if that's not compelling reason to enjoy your life and still have a good quality of life, I'm not sure what is. 
I love what you said. Oh, that's a beautiful reflection. A uh, reminder too that life is not about what we cannot have, but quite the opposite, right? What can I have? Mm -hmm. What can I enjoy here? <laughs> Instead of yeah, creating all these restrictions and limitations and um, believe in them. Thank you so much for your message, Jen. It's highly spiritual, although non-spiritual. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Very much. Um, I have these ending questions for you before I ask them. Would you like to add anything? There's one thing that always comes up when I'm working with clients is you do not need permission to take action. Mm, yeah. Um, it, it's available to you, whatever it is for you. It could be health. It could be business. It could be a passion that you've put to the side for whatever reasons, but you don't need permission for it. Whether you're looking for that permission from a partner, a friend, God, parents, whatever, mm -hmm. your children, yeah. um, nobody's going to give you that permission. You are allowed to give yourself permission. Wow, you got me thinking even more now. <laughs> so <laughs> two more questions for you. <laughs> Before we keep going here forever, my last two questions. If you knew you would die soon, meaning leaving, losing the body, would you make any change or do anything in a different way? I would not change my past because my past created who I am today. However, if I had limited time on this earth and I knew what that timeline looked like, I would be more bold. I would be more daring I would not hesitate or procrastinate. I would just seize life on my terms. And I'm not saying that I don't already do that to some extent, but I yeah. would 10 times what I'm currently doing. <laughs> yeah. right? Go for it. Like right. I would be that yeah. person you see in the spotlight. <laughs> I would be doing all the things and all in service because yeah. Yeah. when we know our time is short, that mm. is when we start thinking, what legacy do I want to leave? Right. And I've been fortunate to have, mm. you know, put those breadcrumbs on the path behind me in my past with podcast interviews such as this or speaking to clients or many different ways I have put the breadcrumbs on the path. But yeah. I would focus on bolder, bigger actions. And yeah, when you say, what's my legacy? I usually say, what is my message? What is the message yeah, that you came here to deliver? If there is one and if there isn't, it's OK, too. Mm -hmm. So my last question to you is, what are three things about life you know for sure as of this moment? Life is beautiful. Yeah. Every moment we're breathing and being on earth is beautiful. Yeah. Life is loving. Even in your darkest days or darkest moments of life, someone loves you. Mm -hmm. Always. Life is also worth having fun. Yes. It's not just about working hard and earning it and type A, like I got to get it done. Got to got to make the donuts. It's not yeah. about that. It's about having fun mm. and appreciating what you have. Thank you so much for sharing your presence, your wisdom, the work you do, the service of helping others and everything else in between that can be felt in the, the spiritual messages that you're not even aware of. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for providing this space. So before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your services, products, and future projects? Yeah, come hang out with me on my online site, which is weightlesschronicles.com. That's not weight loss. It's weightlesschronicles.com. And if you're on Instagram, you'll find me under my handle, which is Jen with two N's, spin, go. On your episode profile, I have the uh, website link, but I don't think I have any other link here. So if you can send it to me, Jennifer, there are any other links you'd like me to have on your podcast profile, please send it to me after the interview. Absolutely. Happy to connect with anyone. Thank you so much again, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Jennifer Espinoza Goswami and her work, please visit weightlesschronicles.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.